Uh, go ahead, let's go ahead and sit down. We're going to get started here. Um, so I invite you to just come and take a seat. Hopefully you got some refreshments next door. Um, what a special opportunity. Uh, my name is Alan Rudolph, the Vice President of Research here at Colorado State. Uh, this is a series that we've been hosting now for two years called Leadership and Innovation. And uh, I can't think, when we bring thought leaders in an innovation, and I, I can't think of any better opportunity to bring the director of DARPA here, Steve Walker, for our Leadership and Innovation series tonight, in part because, as many of you may know, DARPA is an agency that uh, really, I think, has uh, rights to the word innovation in terms of its start. Uh, DARPA, as you may know, was started in the late 50s, uh, really around a time that was described well in the movie Hidden Figures uh, about uh, the United States falling behind in terms of technological superiority. And really that was DARPA's start, was uh, really creating an agency that essentially operates with that same mission today, avoid technological surprise. And they bring people in mid-career, uh, like myself in 1997, uh, where I had the joy of serving at DARPA for uh, about six years at a very formative time. And I think for people who serve at DARPA, it becomes one of those uh, really special experiences, almost cult-like in uh, some, some ways, but uh, really an important agency that funds, still funds today innovation under that same uh, mission. And, and I think all of us are sitting here thinking about what those words avoid technological surprise mean today because they have very similar meanings today with different problem sets than they, ha they had in the late 50s. So we're really fortunate to have, I think it could be the first time we've had the DARP director in Fort Collins at Colorado State. So I think it's also a signal about the importance and impact of the work being done on campus. We have a lot of DARPA projects that are being supported here now and a lot of faculty who have a lot of great ideas that go to DARPA uh, to seek support. So it's a, a really opportunistic for us to have Steve Walker here. Let me give you a little bit of his background then I'll turn it over to Steve. Steve uh, became DARPA's director in November of 2017. He served as a deputy director of the agency from uh, uh, October 2012 to December 2016 and as acting director from January 2017 through October 2017. Uh, prior to his return to DARPA in 2012, he had been there as a, 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 a program manager in the technology uh, um, systems office, but he served as a deputy assistant direct secretary of the Air Force for Science, Technology, and Engineering, uh, where he oversaw the investments the Air Force was making, um, which is sizable um, investments made in science and technology with a sizable size of uh, workforce and uh, application to military uh, science and, and operations. C was in the t uh, DARPA, the technology, uh, tactical technology officer, uh, office, I'm sorry, as a program manager, deputy director, and director. Steve is a member of the Senior Executive Service and a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. He received the AIAA Hap Arnold Award for Excellence in Aeronautical Management in 2014. He's also been awarded the Presidential Rank Award, the Air Force Meritorious Civil, Civil Service Medal, and the DOD Exceptional Meritorious and Distinguished Civil, Civilian Service Medals. He holds a PhD and BS in Aerospace Engineering from the University of Notre Dame and an MS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Dayton. Please help me in welcoming Steve Walker. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I've uh, been in Colorado all week. This is a beautiful place. Um, my son has an internship at uh, Ball Aerospace this summer, so I, I, it was a great opportunity to come out. And I had time to see two schools while I was here. And um, I heard there was a school in Boulder. <laughs> but but I, I didn't, I saw Colorado School of Mines and Colorado State University. I wanted to come uh, see what you guys do here. Ron Siga, where are you, Ron? You're, yeah, he's in the back. He's been trying to get me out here for a while. Uh, and then Alan uh, as well. And so I'm glad I finally made it. So thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to spend some time, and Alan did a great job at introing DARPA a bit, and you know, so what our role is uh, in the S&T ecosystem. I wanted to cover that a little bit more. Uh, as Alan said, we were created in 58 by Dwight Eisenhower to prevent technological surprise after Sputnik went up, and um, 
uh, and, the, and the country was surprised by that uh, at, in some respects. And so we've been doing uh, breakthrough technology uh, for uh, national security and developing capabilities for 60 years now. This was our 60th anniversary. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we're celebrating that at the end. But uh, we focused on capabilities and technology over the years. Some of the capabilities, the first stealth aircraft with the Air Force in the late 70s, uh, precision guided munitions that came out of a DARPA program called Assault Breaker. You saw much of that, uh, uh, much of that became open to the public in Desert Storm. Uh, but on the technology side, uh, I think it's fair to say DARPA helped invent the material science uh, uh, area of research. Uh, was very uh, prevalent in semiconductor work over the years, and then of course connected the first computers together in the late 60s, early 70s, called the ARPANET, which led to the internet. So we've had some successes over the years, uh, and uh, uh, it's my challenge to uh, make sure we continue uh, to have those types of successes. Um, <clears throat> I want to show you a, a little bit about where we fall again in the ecosystem. The pie chart, uh, and I don't know if many of you can see that in the back, but the pie chart really shows our budget's about $3.4 billion, which is a hefty sum of money, but that's a small percentage of the overall federal R&D investment. But that $3.4 billion is very flexible. Uh, we at DARPA have the ability to decide what we spend it on. 92% of that money goes outside the building, uh, and uh, we don't have labs, we don't have large facilities. We have about 200 government employees in the building and about 800 contractors that basically uh, work the programs uh, at DARPA. Um, about 20% goes to universities, and that's 20% that's that goes to a university prime. Uh, we do have universities that team with companies. It's not reflected in that number. Uh, and then we're about 25% of the DOD S&T uh, funding, and that 25%, as I mentioned, is very flexible and really focused at DOD looking at problems and figuring out whether they're even solvable. And so it's not uh, low risk work, it's generally very high impact, and, and with high impact comes high risk. And so DARPA is a place where we're interested in ideas from people all over the country, actually all over the world, and uh, we're willing to take the risk if the impact's big enough. Um, and that's, that's what we shoot for. Um, how are we thinking about our investments today and where we want to make investments? And, and it really comes down to these sort of four things we think about. Wide range of threats to the nation uh, by enemy states, but also non-state actors and criminal networks. Uh, peer competitors are rising again. You know, I think there was a time in the 90s when we thought issues with Russia, issues with, with China weren't that sub significant at the time, but issues with Russia were, were over. Uh, I think that's changing. Uh, and so uh, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Secretary Mattis, has been very clear that uh, the DOD needs to focus in the future on uh, these peer competitions in, in key places in the world, and so we're going to do that. The third area is really, um, you know, we've been fighting terrorism and counterinsurgency now for a long time, 20 plus years. How do we get better at that? Because it's, it's a drain on our resources. These aren't existential threats necessarily to the nation, but they're important, uh, and it's important that we get better at, at doing that job. And so that's some, something that's you know, sort of feeding into our thinking as well. And then technology, uh, something you all here work on uh, every day, uh, research and technology. It's global, you know, a lot of it is out there, uh, and uh, our adversaries have uh, access to it in many cases as much as we do. And so how do we deal with that problem? And how do we take the technology that's out there and stay ahead in certain tech races and turn that technology into capability faster than the adversary? And so those are, those are things that are motivating sort of some of the areas we're investing in, especially in our fundamentals work that we, we do. So I just want to cover real briefly our portfolio and, and, and so how are we addressing those four sort of things that we're thinking about we're really, we're really focused on three system uh, areas of, of work and then a foundations work or a fundamentals uh, focus area. Uh, so first, how do we get better at defending the homeland and dealing with that mul those multivaried threats? Uh, some of the capabilities areas we're, we're interested in is how do we deter cyber attacks? Um, how do we become more resilient in our cyber networks? How do we uh, have a better situational awareness across the network? and actually be able to attribute an attacker down to the person uh, 
anywhere in the world who actually uh, 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 attacked our network. And then how do we get better at cyber offense? And so those are all pieces of how do we deter people from attacking our networks in the future. Um, bio threat detection and mitigation. Uh, we're getting a lot more serious about, uh, and we talked about some of that earlier today, how do we detect bio threats to the country? These would be, you know, pandemics uh, potentially that are accidental or man-made uh, and, um, and things of that nature. Defending against weapons of mass terror is, is also a key area for us, uh, radiological, chemical, biology, uh, and then countering hypersonics. It's been well reported in the public press that Again, those peer competitors have hypersonics programs. Um, these, uh, they're having success in their flight tests. We have some of our own flight tests. We don't talk about them a lot. We have some programs at DARPA working this area. But in terms of countering what they're doing, uh, how, do we, how do we sense their vehicles in flight? Uh, and then how do, we, how do we take them out to defend the homeland? Right now, they're hard vehicles to see because they fly at least five times the speed of sound. That's what hypersonic means. But many times it's, it's closer to 15 to 20 times the speed of sound. So how do you see them in the first place? How do you detect them enough to target them? And then how do you, how do you take them out? So that's a key area for us in defending the homeland. Uh, moving into deterring period competitors, um, adaptive lethality. So uh, the military folks in the room will have heard the term multi-domain battle. and. Uh, and being adaptive in how we uh, distribute systems in order to fight the next war, that one, that's what that's about. So how do we do that air, land, and sea? Uh, space is another critical area for us. We're, how do we make, you know, uh, the administration's talking now about space being a war fighting domain for the first time. And so uh, we used to have big assets in space that were, you know, nobody else was, nobody else was up there. We didn't have to worry about it. We get a lot of capability from space. Just think about GPS and, and the banking systems, et cetera, uh, timing. So um, how do we have a more resilient architecture in space? And so I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's an area for us. And then how do we control the EM spectrum? So you all know we have a lot more devices that uh, are requiring uh, spectrum uh, bandwidth. Uh, how do we make sure we can, can we can operate anywhere in the frequency domain and have our adversaries not operate uh, where they want to operate? Uh, the third area, third system area, is, is really about, you know, instead of, instead of uh, uh, we, we're not that good, actually, at, at looking at other societies uh, where we have to fight terrorism, where we have to counter insurgencies. How do we get better at understanding other societies? So this is where a lot of social science work comes in, which we're, we're investing in, again, heavily. Uh, how do we model those societies, and how can we influence them uh, through soft power and other means uh, to, uh, again, effectively deal with these terrorist threats? Uh, 3D cities, uh, three-dimensional cities, some people are calling them mega cities. More and more people are living in big cities across the world. Scarcity of resources, food, water. Uh, how do we uh, understand how to fight? in a, th a very three-dimensional environment with lots of people uh, and, um, and do that effectively and with low loss of life. Uh, and then warrior performance. Um, how do we, you know, our warriors are fighting uh, in these uh, areas 24-7. How do we help them uh, perform better uh, in, in very stressful conditions? So those are sort of system areas we're focused on and increasing investment in, in those capabilities area areas I talked about. In terms of foundations, and this is really where the basic research and, and a lot of the early technology work comes in, these are the races we want to we want to keep the U.S. out in front. Um, so things like artificial intelligence, and I'll talk a little bit. I, I have a third wave artificial intelligence up there. I'll talk a little bit more about. But how do we stay ahead in the, of that game? How do we stay ahead in advanced electronics? Um, how do we stay ahead in uh, things like uh, advanced materials? And so. These are areas that uh, we very much want to uh, uh, be leading. Uh, many of these technologies will, will be available to all, but then how do we harness those pieces and bring them into the national security space to help defend the nation? Uh, so f I'd like to just give you a few examples of some DARPA programs that we're working in, in several of these spaces. Um, and, uh, and then I'll finish with how do, we, uh, how do you here in Fort Collins work with us? How do you work better with us? 
If you've never, has anybody worked with DARPA in the room? Okay, a few, yeah, quite a, more than I expected, so great. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to uh, remove the veil of mystery a little bit, uh, and uh, you can always talk to Alan here about how to, how to work with DARPA, but uh, you'll hear it from me directly. So uh, talking a little bit about some bio threat, uh, bio threat detection and mitigation work um, in our Defend the Homeland area, you know, accurate information on what's happening uh, in a changing environment uh, to defend the homeland will be absolutely critical. Um, and so, you know, we try and continually sense the environment, uh, and we do that in more, with more traditional means, uh, you know, big RF uh, radar systems, uh, mechanical sensors, these things take a lot of manpower to operate uh, and maintain. So uh, we had a, a agricultural uh, professor from University of Texas, Tyler uh, Blake Beckstein, come to us and say, is there a way to, to take advantage of plants and do this differently? And so one of the things he is working on is the Advanced um, Plant Technologies Program uh, where he's looking at different solutions. So can you harness a plant's natural mechanisms for sensing and responding to environmental stimuli like chemicals or pathogens uh, and, um, and have the plant tell us, you know, what it's sensing by looking at it visually, uh, using, a, using different uh, interrogation methods of the plant. Um, so this is kind of a wacky idea, um, but that's what we do. Uh, so. One of the things he's trying to do in this program is not modify just one or two genes of a plant, which, which folks are doing uh, in, in the research world, but he's trying to modify uh, the very complex genome of a plant in order to uh, provide this capability um, and uh, do, do so in a way that, you know, doesn't kill the plant, right? It doesn't, it, the plant is able to survive and thrive uh, with this changed genome. So the, the goal is to modify the complex traits in the plant and to provide this sensing capability uh, for us. If the program is successful, um, we think we'll have a sen new sensing platform that we can use that's energy independent, robust, uh, maybe stealthy, and easily distributed. Um, those are some of the goals of the, the program. We also think, you know, some civilian uses are potentially to, uh, to look for unexploded ordnance or mines, have the plants change in some way, shape, or form to tell us what's underground. So. There are lots of potential uses for this technology. So Blake's other program is uh, called Insect Allies, uh, which is kind of an, another interesting idea. Um, what he's trying to do with this program is to respond quickly to an agricultural attack. So, you know, food, food, food security is becoming a bigger issue, and uh, what if an adversary wanted to take down major crops in this country? Um, so, you know trying to think outside the box of what somebody might, might want to do. Uh, and so um, today's method, today's response method would be burn the whole crop and wait, you know, five years for it to come back and, and produce uh, food again. Um, so what, one of the things he thought about doing was let's harness insects and let's make them our allies in basically quickly replenishing a crop that might have been attacked in some way. Uh, so developing a r rapid response platform Again, using biology, um, insects are very good at transmitting uh, viruses. You know, they can do it effectively and quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you in the room who work in this space know that. Um, but not all virus, you know, I said, so we want to use insects to put viruses in plants. That doesn't sound good. Uh, and he told me, well, not all, all viruses are bad. There can be good viruses. Uh, and, and so, um, <clears throat> One of the things we're doing in this program is looking to see whether we can edit the genome of a virus to have some positive attributes uh, and then um, have the insect transmit the virus uh, and immunize, you know, a whole crop of plants, let's say. So the, the performers on this program, this, these happen to be UT Austin, uh, and um, what you're seeing here is a picture on the left of a viral of a virus, a uh, circular virus, and one of the things the, the gene editing technique will do is uh, take that circular virus, turn it into a linear uh, uh, virus there. The cargo red piece is the piece we care about, uh, and if you make it linear instead of circular, you can get it into this factory that apparently is a part of every aphid 
uh, insect. Uh, and uh, these factories then will produce um, these positive viruses uh, in a, in a, in a, at scale. And the aphid, I'm told, uh, instead of chew chewing plants, it, it has sort of a, a needle, a hypodermic needle that it sticks into the plants and transmits uh, the virus that way and then sucks out the energy from the plant uh, to, uh, to eat. Uh, and so the idea here is to have the aphids uh, basically uh, spread a good positive virus throughout a plant to help protect it quickly. Again, using insects to do this quickly. So um, this is a video I'm going to show you. Um, I don't know if the lights can be turned down at all, but uh, you guys know where the light switch is? Maybe it's right here. There you go. Uh, I'll show you this video. It's a video of a tobacco plant. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner is just a, a backlight and a, a leaf of another plant, but you'll start to see the plant show up. Uh, and what we've done is we've uh, created this tobacco uh, mosaic virus. We've injected it into the plant, uh, and um, we've got a green fluorescence in there to show the virus spreading throughout the plant. This was done with an, an aphid. So um, the video is playing, and you should start to see the plant show up through the green fluorescence that uh, is spreading through it, throughout it. I don't know if you can see it with the light coming through the window, but you can start to see it. So this is really early work at UT Austin to look and see how uh, useful this, this transfer of a virus is to a plant through an insect. Um, and um, uh, I don't want you to worry too much because one of the things I worried about is doing this in the real world. Uh, what we're doing, the end, the end goal of this program is a greenhouse with 20 plants and 20 insects, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how this works. Um, but we're not doing this in the wild, and of course the USDA, and I guess this place called US Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, uh, you guys probably know them. Um, they're involved with us working this program, making sure we're doing this safely. So it's an interesting idea. Um, I hate to talk about bees in front of Dr. Rudolph um, <laughs> because he's had some experience with bees. But um, one of the things we're doing here is, uh, and this is not a bee program, but it's, it's a program looking at the microbiome and how it affects uh, the rest of a, of a host. And so for those of you not familiar with uh, microbiomes, they're, they're basically small living things you can't see, like bacteria, virus, fungi, things like that. Um, and all of us have these things in our stomach, the microbiome, uh, in our gut, uh, thousands of them. And um, uh, people have shown through, I, I think people have been really studying the microbiome over the last 10 years or so in a big way, showing the effect of your microbiome and what that does to your digestion, your responses to pathogens. And actually they've shown some uh, microbiome effects with, uh, with neuro signaling in your brain. And so. Um, one of the things DARPA would like to do, instead of just understand the microbiome, see if we can engineer it. Uh, and so um, what we're doing here is, uh, and, you know, in case you're worried about that, the nice thing about a microbiome is uh, it's not like you're changing a genome. It's, it's, you, can, you can modify a microbiome and you can treat it with antibiotics to get rid of it. You can you know, get it out of the host. You're not changing the host by doing that. Um, but in this program called BRICS, we're looking at, uh, we wanted to pick a social animal, so the PI picked a bee. Uh, and uh, what, one of the things they're doing under the program is developing a toolbox uh, to engineer the gut microbiome. And so they're using the bee as an example here. Um, but uh, technically speaking, the toolbox is called this, this thing called an ARCMID, which is a plas plasmid. And um, again, plasmids don't permanently alter the cell's genome. Um, but uh, they put this, um, they put this, uh, they use these tools to basically stably express a precursor of dopamine in the bee and uh, through the microbiome. And uh, what, what started happening was the bees started so showing more social behavior, more interaction, more energy. Uh, the data on the, the right there just shows with the, the dopamine expression versus a control that didn't have it. 
And so they were able to show that by, by using these tools to change the microbiome of the bee, they were changing uh, through this chemical dopamine uh, the activity of the bee. And so bee was just used here as an example, but it's, it's work that, again, is at the basic research level showing how you can engineer biology to actually have effects. Um, and, you know, this is a program near and dear to my heart because, you know, there's a lot going on in gene editing. I think DARPA needs to be in the gene editing space to prevent technological surprise in order to understand it, understand the technology. But Safe Genes is all about understanding how to turn a gene editor off if, if something goes wrong. And so, uh, you know, you can think about folks using gene editing for nefarious purposes, but you can also think about people just having accidents and uh, doing something they didn't intend to do. And so um, this program is looking, it's, again, it's a basic research program, but it's looking at can you reverse gene edits that you didn't want? Can you, can you develop countermeasures to actually have them not work? Uh, and um, can, you, can you do rem remediation if a gene editor was ever released into the wild? And so, uh, again, basic research, but I think it's a program that, that we need at DARPA to understand the technology, but also understand how to stop it. Um, I'm going to keep moving, but uh, moving into the system, system area number two, uh, deterring and prevailing against peer adversaries. This is really, a, a, again, a, a program, a challenge. Sometimes DARPA does challenges uh, instead of programs, and this is where we put, put a challenge out to the world to say, hey, this, we have a hard problem. We're not sure how to solve it. We don't know enough to, to be smart on this topic, and so we're, we're asking for different uh, concepts, new ideas. This is one I mentioned before where, um, you know, lots of le electronic devices these days taking up more and more spectrum. Uh, right now, we use a system um, that's a century old where, you know, the government basically decides who can use what bands of the spectrum uh, for what purposes. And the PM here, uh, Paul Tillman, wanted to see where, whether we could use new techniques in artificial intelligence to have a whole bunch of radios figure out how to use the same bandwidth in a collaborative way uh, and, uh, and do it without interfering with each other. And so what he's built here is a Coliseum at Johns Hopkins APL where he can connect 256 radios in an emulated, uh, very complex environment, say a city, and uh, emulate you know, uh, radio waves bouncing off of buildings, et cetera. Uh, and the culmination of this, uh, and you can see the teams that are participating, most of them are university teams, but the culmination of this event is going to be um, in 2019, where he's going to have five teams with 20 radios each uh, having to use the same bandwidth and do it in a very collaborative way using these AI techniques. So it's kind of an interesting, if you can actually do this, the FCC is following this program closely, and we could free up a lot of spectrum if this actually uh, works well. Uh, and considering, I don't know how many billions of cell phones there are in the world now, but uh, it keeps growing. But this is a, an unclassified open challenge, giving, you know, allowing us to see if this will work. Uh, but you can imagine using these tools and techniques to help the U.S. military uh, work in bands we want to work in and prevent our adversaries from doing the same. In terms of making space more robust, more resilient, um, this is a new program. This is a, the, B, the Broad Agency announcement is actually out on the street right now. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, the way we've done space, and we were able to do it this way because there, were, there was nobody up there threatening our assets, build big, uh, monolithic space satellites, put them 35,000 kilometers up at GEO, uh, very capable systems, very expensive, a uh, billion dollars a piece in some cases, uh, very expensive to launch, uh, and, uh, and a lot of time to actually develop the satellite and put it up there. So how do we do this differently, especially since others are, are active in space right now? Blackjack is an idea we had where we want to take advantage of what's happening in the commercial world. So lots of companies are talking about uh, building thousands of satellites. SpaceX is a company. Uh, Boeing's actually talking about it. OneWeb, some, some, some of the smaller companies are talking about putting up a space internet, essentially. And so this is going to require thousands of smaller satellites at low Earth orbit. One of the things we want to do is take advantage of that economies of scale, you know, cheap space buses, 
put our own payloads on top of a subset of those uh, satellites uh, and, um, and do that for 10 to, f if you include launch, do that for about $15 million a satellite. And you can think about if you had, the, this program is going to do 20 such satellites, but we think we could, the operational system would be something like 100, depending on what you want to use the satellites for. But you can think about worldwide coverage of um, sensing capability uh, and uh, an alternative to GPS, potentially, uh, uh, an alternative to some of the timing uh, systems that we have on orbit now, uh, and some other missions. And so this would allow us to have um, uh, a very affordable capability. I think it's more resilient because an adversary would have to try and take out hundreds of satellites uh, that were part of a commercial network, uh, which is which is a little bit uh, off-putting. And so I think uh, we're going to try this. Uh, the Air Force has come on board. They're very interested in trying to do do their space uh, differently, and uh, we'll see what happens. But the demo will be about 2020, 2021. I want to go into the third system area a little bit, and I talked about very three-dimensional cities. Cities are, are becoming more complex. You can look at a major city and see the skyscrapers. What you can't often see is what's below, and so a lot of transportation system below, uh, uh, underground facilities, uh, and so how do, we, how do we deal with that in cities overseas that we might find ourselves in? And so um, the sub-T challenge, sub-training challenge, is a new challenge where we've the BAA was out this, this spring looking at um, how do we get better at sensing the environment uh, underground without human intervention. So think, think small robots, uh, think small drones. Uh, what are the communication systems that you're going to need to bring with you uh, to operate underground? And, uh, and lot, lots of hard challenges. So one of the reasons we were at mines yesterday is we, we went and toured the Edgar Mine. Uh, to see if that would be a useful facility to actually do this challenge. Uh, we're, we're making our way around the country to look at that. But um, this should be an interesting challenge, a lot of interest by uh, military uh, users, but this is completely open, so we put this out to the world, and then we'll see uh, what performers come in. Where performance? Uh, so, again, Dr. Rudolph started a lot of the um, programs that we had at DARPA back in the early 2000s that were focused on uh, restoring wounded warriors and, and looking at revolutionizing prosthetics, because back then they had a hook, essentially, when they were coming home uh, wounded. And so a couple programs came out of that. One was a, a really uh, high degree of freedom hand called the Luke, it's called the Luke Arm that is now for sale uh, through the Veterans Administration to for wounded warriors. Um, and uh, it's controlled using stepper motors and wireless technology. It's, it's a very, very good arm. Another thing that came out of that was actually tapping into the motor cortex of the brain and actually being able to control the, the, uh, the prosthetic uh, just by thinking about it. And we, we did some experiments with folks who were willing to have brain surgery, uh, and uh, they proved very successful. Um, but again, not everybody wants to have brain surgery. so. When this program was, was haptics, and the idea here was to, instead of tapping into a person's brain, tap into the remaining nerve endings that may be in the uh, stump of the arm uh, that maybe still work, uh, and maybe there's some nerve endings there that aren't working anymore, but stimulate them in a way to have them pass, pass uh, information back to the brain, and then put sensors in the, the uh, automatic hand, the robotic hand, to allow a person to actually feel, feel and have that sensory perception come back through the nerve endings back into the brain and be able to have much more uh, control in that hand. And so, I don't know, most of you are younger in the room, but I know I watched The Six Million Dollar Man in the 70s. We're actually seeing it um, now, and I'll show you a video of, of this in action. I mean, there's a lot of technology here in terms of um, how you tap into that nerve bundle with what sensors, uh, how you uh, uh, put uh, sensors in the muscle uh, if the nerve ending isn't active, uh, how you go through uh, wirelessly through a chip that has AI algorithms built into it that actually uh, describe what a person should be feeling and, and what that should do to the nerve 
to pass that information back up to the brain. So a lot of technology in here. Um, this is uh, Kevin, who is one of our human subjects in this program. I will tell you that's a that's a um, a raw egg. It is not hard boiled. Um, but what this is going to show you is uh, this idea of ha being able to sense through this robotic hand, and the 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 agility and the flexibility that gives him to actually pick up a raw egg and do something with it. So. Stimulation on that you saw on the video uh, means, you know, the, the basically the stimulation of the nerve endings was turned on at that point and allowed him to sense the egg. So pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so thank you for starting all that. Um, I want to move into the information piece a little bit. Uh, DARPA, there's a lot of hype about AI right now. Uh, DARPA thinks about AI in three waves. First wave was expert systems, so you can think of TurboTax, you know, if-then statements, if this is true, then do this. Uh, second wave is really what we're in now, which is machine learning. So DeepMind, Google's DeepMind, machine learning uh, algorithms, neural nets. Um, these are very powerful uh, if you train them on a large data set and you don't get out of that data set. Uh, as soon as you show them something that's not in the data set, they fail pretty miserably. So there are still a lot of limitations on what you can use these things for. They're doing better than humans on recognizing images, uh, but we've shown cases where if you modify the image slightly, it tells you it's something completely different. So uh, these things are still very fragile. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in third wave, which we, we believe is, is, is the future, is how the human and the machine interact uh, and, and a partnership and how the machine can help the human understand what it's actually really doing. And so this is a program called Explainable AI where, I don't know if Dave Gunning's in the room, I don't think he is, but he's a program manager of this where, you know, today's machine learning is on the top. It'll tell you it's a cat with a certain probability, but it doesn't tell you why it's a cat. It doesn't tell you uh, whether it could be something else. Uh, it doesn't tell you when it fails and uh, it's pretty much a black box, and the human has to trust the black box. Well, warfighters don't like to trust machines anyway, but what we want to do is, is get a machine to tell them why it's a cat, because it has fur, it has whiskers, it has ears, pointy ears. Um, uh, we want them to tell, you know, we want them to tell the human when it, when it thinks it's succeeded. We want, to tell the, we want it to tell the human when it thinks it, it's confused, when, it, when, it's, when it's failing. Uh, that's almost just as important. So this is a basic research program focused on, you know, trying to understand, you know, we've got psychologists involved in this, uh, computer scientists, uh, a wide variety of folks looking at how to make this interface uh, much more transparent, which I think is going to be required uh, if we're going to trust AI in the future. Uh, related to AI, we have another program called Lifelong Learning of Machines, and this is really about uh, helping machines get better when they do go outside, outside the bounds of what they were trained on. So on the left, you see what we're trying to do here, and this is just very conceptually, and this, this is basic research that just started. But you know, a machine that's trained on a certain data system is really that orange curve. And once it's fielded, once it's out in, in operation, it can't get any better. It's, it's only as good as the data it was trained on. What we're trying to do is get up the green line where we can actually have the machine improve as it goes along and maybe if it sees small extrapolations from the data it was trained on, it can understand how to improve itself. On the right hand side, we're looking at what happens when you get way outside the data, uh, a data set and the machine is surprised. Today, what often happens is the machine will give you a, a very bad answer. Uh, and it'll, it'll tell you that's the answer. Uh, what we'd like to do is say, instead of that, how do, we, how do we help the machine adapt to a changing environment and be able to uh, tell the, again, tell the human that it is adapting, it's in this, it's, 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 it's in this learning phase, and, uh, and uh, help give the human a better, a better answer. So 
Um, again, this is very basic, basic research. Um, we are focused on the human machine interface here and how to help humans do their job better instead of creating a machine that does this on, the, on its own, which is sort of where everyone goes with the research. Um, those are both sort of examples of uh, work we're doing in our foundations focus. This is another one. Um, DARPA, as I mentioned, had a, has a, had a long history in semiconductors. Advanced electronics, these are really important to our DOD systems, as well as the commercial sector. Uh, for those of you who don't know electronics, it's really been guided by something called Moore's Law, which, which basically says you can double the number of transistors on your chip uh, every 18 months or so. Well, we're getting to the point where that's becoming harder and harder to do just physically. Uh, and also the design costs and the manufacturing costs on these chips, the more transistors you put on them, uh, really those costs are, are going up and taking much longer to do. And so the commercial sector is, uh, is realizing that, that they may be coming to an end in this, in this, uh, in this Moore's Law, um, which has really supported the industry all these years. The other thing that's happened is China, uh, again, one of those peer competitors, has decided this is going to be a major area of emphasis for them. We are still way ahead in design, way ahead in manufacturing. They've decided they're going to put $150 billion into this industry over the next so many years. And what they're trying to do is attract foundries on, onto their shore uh, and the IP that comes with it, right? So they're making a big play in this area. One of the things we're, we can do at DARPA so we're not going to solve the manufacturing problem and the foundry problem. But one, one of the things we're doing in, in a program, a series of programs called Electronics Resurgence Initiative is uh, leapfrog where today's technology is. And so this is one of the tech races we're going to win. Um, how are we going to do that? We're going to reduce the design cycle time through a series of programs. Instead of 18 months to design a new circuit, we're going to try and take that down to days. And this is another application of AI, where if you train an AI system on how to design a chip, that can help the human design the chip much faster in the future. Uh, the other thing is three-dimensional chip structures. So instead of a, just a 2D substrate, uh, putting more in, on the three-dimensional uh, uh, axes of a chip, uh, getting more processing power for less, for less uh, cost and less power, uh, uh, less energy. Uh, are some of the ideas that we have. There's about six new programs starting in this space. Uh, and so um, this is a, a race we intend to win. Uh, the other thing that's unique about this is this is just not military. This is, uh, we've got the Intel's cadences, synopsis, the commercial electronics companies in the U.S. are working with us on this program. So um, stay tuned for a lot of good electrical engineering uh, work to come out of this. Um, again, in our foundations portfolio, this is just a fun new basic research program looking at new ways to compute. So instead of uh, the von Neumann computing that we, we've all come to enjoy and rely on, uh, we're looking at could you actually use uh, molecules. Uh, we think we can use molecules to, well, we know we can use DNA to store data very effectively. Uh, how do you pull the data out is, is, can be time consuming. But can you use molecules to store data? And then can you use molecules to operate on each other to actually do the computing? So this is a very 6-1 basic research effort. But again, this is DARPA scratching the surface at a, a new way to do something. We don't know if this is going to work. It probably won't. But we're going to learn some things from this. And oftentimes what happens at DARPA is the second, third, fourth program that started in this space actually, actually comes through with the impact. And finally, the final example I'll give you in foundations is social science. So I mentioned we're getting into social science in a big way. One of the issues we see with social science is its repeatability, uh, its robustness sometimes. Uh, lots of experiments are done. Lots of research are, uh, results are reported on. Uh, and, and lo and behold, everything's successful. Uh, but, but we still don't understand how putting one, two, and three people together equals a crowd. We don't understand uh, collective identity in many cases. And so one of the things we want to do on this circle is do better modeling, but then also have uh, the PIs that are part of this program uh, pre-register their models, pre-register their predictions, do the experiments, uh, and then open that, uh, those results up to the community, 
uh, open up the tools they use, the materials they use, and then keep doing this to see if we can get better replication, uh, better re re reproducibility in this community to be able to use these tools to more effectively model a society uh, and be able to uh, predict outcomes of that society given, uh, given things that might happen there, essentially, you know, related to the whole counterterrorism thing I talked about earlier. So those are just some examples. We have 250 programs at DARPA. Those are a few uh, that touch on different areas that we're working in, some examples of what we do. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about says Windows, gonna, Windows is going to shut down in 10 minutes. So. <laughs> but these slides are... Oh, it's about to restart. <clears throat> I'll just talk through some of these as I can. They're, they're, you know, just word charts. How do you work with DARPA better? So um, there's a couple things you should know. And again, you can always talk to Alan, but Seedlings versus programs. So we have this concept at DARPA called a seedling, which is uh, about a 12, it could be anywhere from six to 12 months. And um, every office at DARPA, there are six offices, tech offices. Uh, you can go to our website, darpa.mil, and see each of the offices. Each office has what they call an open broad agency announcement, which is open all year long. And it has in there uh, interest areas of the office, uh, broad interest areas. Uh, and so seedlings versus programs. The open BAAs are really focused on starting these six to 12 month efforts that really uh, try and focus on whether uh, this, this crazy idea is even possible, right? And so uh, um, they can be anywhere from 100K to a million dollars, depending on what the uh, effort looks like. And the way to, the, way, the best way to uh, basically uh, get your idea uh, put forward at DARPA is to go on the website, go look at the open BAA. If you have an idea, a crazy idea especially, that fits in one of the areas that we're interested in in the open BAA, give the office a call, give the program manager a call that's uh, responsible, um, thank you, responsible for that area and strike up a conversation either through email, phone, short phone call, um, they're interested in ideas, and we get most of our ideas from the performer community, from universities, from industry, and other folks. Um, these are, this is a, just a view graph that shows the six different offices. Um, but here's what I was talking about with seedlings. Um, they're really little studies to take something that is completely unbelievable, and at the end of it, you should have just a mere doubt that it, it's, it's possibly <laughs> successful. You could be su possibly successful. Um, a lot of the times, these things lead to our big program ideas, right? So if we can prove that something is just, you know, doubtful, a program manager will build a program idea and bring it up to leadership and say, I really want to go do revolutionizing prosthetics. I think this can be done. We did a short study with somebody. Uh, they, sh they, they proved that this might be possible. Let's go do it. If leadership signs off, then you'll see the big solicitation uh, that comes out, typically programs of that scale are $20 million to $100 million even. Uh, and uh, the great thing about DARPA is the resources are there. Uh, the program manager has a lot of autonomy and flexibility to go make it happen. Uh, and, um, uh, it's, but it's all based on ideas. So, and we get our ideas from people like you. Um, I already talked a little bit about this, but the, the most important thing is find the program manager and talk to him or her. Uh, submit your ideas to the office YBAA, which is on our website, again, for seedlings. I think that if you've never worked with DARPA before, that's probably the best way to get involved with DARPA from the beginning. And then uh, respond to our program BAAs. When possible, you all ha here have several pro programs and, and efforts going on in some of our bigger programs. Keep doing that. Um, we stood up this biological technologies office about four and a half years ago. Uh, lots of young P PMs there with, with ideas. Uh, a program coming out 
soon to look at uh, some gene editing techniques for a soldier to provide a temporary uh, uh, protection against a, a chem bio radiological threat. So lots of interesting ideas. But when you submit a, an abstract or a proposal or even talking to the PM, this is kind of how you have to describe what your, what your idea is all about. It's called the Heilmeier Catechism. This is something we live and die by at DARPA. Heilmeier was a director back in the late 70s. These are very simple questions, but it's amazing how hard they are to answer sometimes. And sometimes the, pro the question that typically trips most people up is what are you trying to do? What is, the <laughs> what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And just articulating that in plain English uh, sometimes is difficult. Um, not only for the, the PIs out there, but also for the program managers coming up to leadership. Uh, how's it done today? So we want to know sort of how your idea compares to what other people are doing or what's been done. And what's new about your idea? And then who's going to care uh, if we go do this and we're successful? How are you going to measure your success? So through some midterm and final exams, what are the metrics that you'll show us along the way that explain uh, how you're doing? And of course, how much is it going to cost and what's it going to take? Uh, you know, the thing on here uh, that is the biggest deal for us is if you are successful, what difference is it going to make? Low impact stuff, we're not that interested in. If you're going to change the world with your idea, that's what we're interested in, DARPA. So that's what you, those are the ideas you need to think about and bring to us, and we'll work with you. Last chart, uh, DARPA is 60 years old. We are having our D60 conference in September, September 5 to 7 at D in DC at the National Harbor. Uh, sign up on the website if you're interested in coming. You'll learn a lot about what DARPA has done in the past, what we're doing today, but more importantly, where we're headed in the future. Uh, and you'll hear, you'll hear for some, some greats from the past. Uh, some of the people that invented the internet will be there talking about it. Uh, and uh, it'll be a fun time. So with that, I am going to get off, or I'm going to actually open it up for questions. Uh, happy to take questions from anybody about how DARPA, how DARPA works. Uh, you know, now's your chance. Thanks. Yes, um, we, um, it was on my uh, chart there, but we, we, did, we did the first drone uh, that led to the Predator aircraft. So we, we've had a, a history in the air vehicle drone uh, area for sure. Probably the last, yeah, it's, it's hard to consider it a drone because it's so big, but one of the last things we did was um, an autonomous ship. So this, is, this has now been transitioned to the Navy for them to experiment with. This is a program that's about five years old called Sea Hunter, where we built a 132-foot-long ship, uh, and uh, we did it at a yacht company, so uh, it wasn't a traditional ship builder. Uh, we did it for about $20 million, uh, and the ship had us enough fuel on board, two diesel engines, and enough fuel on board to go once around the world. So the program manager had this idea of could you, we spent a lot of time and money and use a lot of platforms to track enemy submarines. I'll just describe this because this is, this is a little bit about how DARPA works. How can we track an enemy, enemy submarine uh, without all these airplanes and other submarines and all this equipment and manpower? So you had this idea of this autonomous ship that could go once around the world and track a submarine and stay on it and report back to the Navy, you know, what it was doing. Well, the Navy absolutely hated that idea. Um, for lots of reasons, but they, they thought it was too provocative or whatever, or it got rid of their airplanes and people. I don't know. But, uh, but uh, they absolutely hated it, but DARPA went ahead anyway, actually. And so it's an important point about DARPA is we don't, we're part of the Defense Department, but we have the autonomy not to focus on military requirements. Uh, we're, we, we have the freedom to not, to explore uh, places where the services don't necessarily want to go, uh, which I think is an important uh, 
flexibility and autonomy that we have. So anyway, we went away, we went ahead and did this. We developed it. You have to put all the software and autonomy on board for the ship to follow all the laws of the sea without people on board. Uh, so we're still in the experimental stages with the Navy on that. But the Navy has come around now and said, hey, we, think of, we can think of all sorts of things to use this for besides tra tracking enemy subs, right? Logistics, countermine, mining operations, uh, some classified missions. So it's, it's, um, this is a story that repeats over and over. Uh, with DARPA and the services. And, uh, so that's our latest kind of drone thing. Um, the Sub-T challenge is going to be all about how we, how we operate with robots underground. So. Yep. Back there. Range for, uh, target range for success of your research programs? Uh, target range, like the range where we're, uh, the, the time frame? Per percent. So like, Coming oh. from R and D, oh. when you're really doing research, if you're always succeeding, you're not pushing yeah. the envelope. Right. So, right. Do you have a, a target? We don't track that metric. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. We actually don't track that on purpose because we do get asked that a lot, and um, we completely agree with you that if you're if you're trying to hit 90 percent of a transition, or you know, transitioning 90 percent of what you're doing to the services, we're not thinking big enough. So. Um, we actually don't track it, but we do. What we do is try and tell stories about transitions that were successful. Uh, but as I said, we're we're really focused on high impact, and so my former boss used to say, if we could do high impact, low risk programs, she would. Uh, but but the the high impact programs tend to be very high risk, and many of them don't work. That's a good question. Um, uh, I just wonder, you have really good insight on what's you know what's happening in the world of technology, and it seems like batteries are one thing that have just not improved over yeah, I know. you know all this time. And so, <laughs> is there any hope? It's a it's a really it's a really important technology area for many reasons, as as you might imagine, as you know. DARPA. Got out of, I was telling others earlier, got out of the energy sort of power space largely when ARPA-E was stood up, and they were focused a lot on energy uh, and, and battery. And I think probably the best research being sponsored today on batteries is out of ARPA-E, I would say. Um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier to some folks, we have a new lead on our defense science office, uh, Dr. Valerie Browning. Uh, she is a material science uh, power and energy person, so I expect we'll be getting back into that space a bit. But to answer your question more directly, I, I feel like it's plateaued myself, and I, we haven't been making the investment because we haven't seen the, the, uh, the ability to make a difference at this point. I, I see an interesting balance between the desire for DARPA to want to keep their technologies uh, confidential, and then at uh, ac in academia you want to publish. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> how do you view that balance and, and deal with it? And and also has DARPA considered perhaps uh, investing in uh, more private companies, let's say startups that are developing technologies that might be uh, useful for the, the defense community and, and tackling it via that route? Yeah. That's a great question, and we struggle with that all the time because we need the best and brightest people to work on our programs to make a difference, and many of those people are at places like uh, Fort Collins, universities, uh, and so we work with universities a lot. Um, but uh, so we do a lot of tool development, um, you know, in the unclassified space and university world. Uh, we actually, um, uh, just an example, um, some of our uh, software development that we do in our information innovation office, uh, cyber, cyber world, um, we, we do uh, that kind of software development in very much a DevOps way. So bring in the best and brightest people we know how, you know, that, that do that kind of work. Many of them are uncleared or at universities. Bring them in for summer camps. 
uh, and and we have them develop the code, and but we actually give them problems that are supplied to us by um, warfighters and others who have interesting applications, right? Um, and so um, it's a balance. We we want to do the best work we can with the be brightest people. Um, ideally, we get those people to work in DoD uh, and uh, in classified spaces. Sometimes we can do that, but. Um, we, we try and balance the best we can. Um, oftentimes, we can se separate the tech development from the application. So that's what we, we try and do. And as we talked earlier in the session with students, uh, DARPA needs to prevent technological surprise. And that means we, we, uh, we need to be out front in understanding how technology works. But I don't want technologists sitting around deciding how it's applied. Uh, that needs to be a bigger conversation with war fighters, but also uh, legal folks, policy folks, ethicists uh, at the table. So we have, especially in our neuroscience and our gene editing areas, um, and also in some of the information work where it touches on privacy, we bring outside experts in to look at all of our proposals and make sure that um, you know, other people are involved in that discussion. So. Steve, I wanted to ask yeah. about the social And sort of the valley of transitioning technology. And I think land grant universities kind of pride themselves a bit on the social cultural activities because of the historic extension uh, activities we've had uh, through history. Um, a, a lot of what you talked about in terms of the impact of doing social science and understanding different communities is interesting also in the context of the team building that even goes on within DARPA programs. You yeah. have very diverse performers, especially in some of the left and right coast universities, extremely diverse cultural performers. Right. And it seems to me that uh, one of the opportunities DARPA might have is actually study itself in terms of the social science. We've done some of that here on campus in teaming programs where we've actually created a teaming program but then turn our social sciences onto the teaming program. We're actually studying our teams. Now this has gone on in the business community a bit for looking at team performance. but it seems to me that every DARPA program is a bit of a social experiment. <laughs> That's and, true. And, and I think is an opportunity to, to actually understand how a team performs that could be quite diverse in a, in a mission-oriented way. Yeah. And so I, I just wondered, you know, in addition to looking at the, you know, um, I'm entering into a new village, a new society, how to interact with it, are there some opportunities to look even at ourselves as, as a way to understand social sciences in a way that will translate to these problems. I think actually some of that's happening in the NGS2 program. Uh, the, per, the PM there is Adam Russell, who's an anthropologist. And so um, he's trying to improve the rigor and repeatability of social science, but I know he's actually studying his he's performer doing. teams as he's doing it. So, yeah. Um, oh. Yep. Studying yourself, how do you manage your own security? You've got such a unique, uh, a unique effort here. How do you how do you uh, design the security? Because it looks like it's just full of holes. The security. I mean, yeah, getting people, you know, soliciting ideas and, mm. and to the public. And uh, how do you roughly how do you manage that kind of security situation? Uh, I. Th I think I understand what you're saying in terms of the program security once we start a program or just the, oh, just the dealing with the public or, <laughs> oh, no. Where do the ideas go? Is that what you think? It's a unique organization and you need a unique security system. We have a, we have, uh, we have security folks that are attached to our um, classified programs for sure. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, everything we, put out to the public is reviewed by a security team, et cetera. So I think we have a pretty good uh, established system. Um, the, you know, we're constantly trying to decide, you know, what do we release, what, what don't we release. Uh, but I think, you know, we are a transparent society, so we, uh, we err on that side of things. Um, but if it's classified, we have to keep it classified. We're not currently that much. Uh, we, again, we, we have had programs in that space in the past, but uh, we 
a previous director when RPE was stood up sort of decided we'll, we'll let them focus on that. Um, I understand, you know, their mission may be changing too, and so we're, uh, we'll only take another look at it, but uh, we're not, we don't have a lot there currently. Blooper reel? Uh, we actually do. If you want to, <laughs> uh, one of our last big challenges was called the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And you could probably search on YouTube for it. But uh, the, the idea of that program was to develop uh, humanoid robots that could go into a place like Fukushima, turn valves, open doors, do things that humans would normally do, but you can't send a human in because of the radiation environment. So, really cool program. The program manager had teams from all over the world participate, build these really weird looking humanoid robots. And it's probably on YouTube, but you can see how well they did. They didn't do so hot. So, yeah.